going to put 2 Samuel on hold for tonight because I have a friend who's here from San Diego, California, and his name is Jim Garland. Now, Jim was here, Did you, you filled a Sunday for me last summer when I was gone, so you might remember Jim, um, but he is one of the most well-traveled people I know who has had opportunities, along with his wife, Rosemary, to visit many different world leaders around the world. And he just really has his finger on the pulse of what is happening globally in terms of just events, current events, as it relates to prophecy too. What is the enemy up to as we see what God is also doing and how the enemy is coming against some of the things that God is doing. Uh, Jim Garlow pastored for more than 40 years. He pastored uh, Skyline Wesleyan Church in San Diego. And, uh, and now today he has a ministry called Well Versed. And uh, he's written a book by the same name, Well-Versed Biblical Answers to Today's Tough Issues. And uh, he covers a lot of things in here from climate change to Israel to gender identity to, to politics, like you name it. This guy's a bold guy. This guy was leading the cause years ago of actually getting so political intentionally from his pulpit in San Diego that then they would, he along with, I don't know how many other churches you had as that part of that, like 2,000 churches at one point in that network, and they would send their messages to the IRS and say, come get us. <laughs> and the IRS never came after you. Um, so he's that kind of a bold and courageous guy. Uh, and so I'm, I'm excited to have him here. Now he's going to, he's going to speak for about 20 minutes and then the reason you see the chairs up here is because I'm going to then come up and kind of interview him and talk about current events and stuff happening in our culture and just how we can understand some of these things through a biblical lens. Um, I did know some things about you, uh, Jim. You have more degrees than a thermometer. Uh, I, <laughs> You earned a Master of Theology from Princeton Theological Seminary, a Master of Divinity from Asbury Theological Seminary, a Bachelor's and Master's Degrees from Southern Nazarene University, and a PhD in Historical Theology from Drew University. He also served as a professor at Oklahoma Wesleyan. He's written 15 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Cracking Da Vinci's Code. Um, Jim was married for 42 years to Carol. She died in cancer in 2013. And, um, and he is now married to Rosemary. And Rosemary is a Schindler, if you all remember Schindler's list. So Rosemary was married to a Schindler. Her husband died also. And so Jim and Rosemary married in 2014. And between them, they have eight children and 14 grandchildren. And uh, the reason why they were here in the area is because they attended an event in DC where uh, Israeli President Itzhak Herzog was invited, and they were guests at that event. And so I'm glad that he's here, and I'll have more to say about the book and the calendar that goes with it too. But would you give a warm welcome to Jim Garlow? Well, what a joy to be with you. There's about, uh, oh, I think four different preachers that I enjoy listening to. And it's not that the rest of them are, are good, they're, they're, they're all great, but there's only four that seem to hold my attention. They, they stimulate my thinking. And one of those fours is Gary Hamrick. And it's more than that. I've listened to more, this is a true fact, more of Gary's sermons than the other three put together. Uh, and I got stuck in Revelation. I'm redoing Revelation. And what it mounts, I, I'm so afraid Jesus is going to get back before I get finished with Revelation. That's where I'm at. So I'm not going to share with you a sermon. I'm just going to share with you some various thoughts, uh, sort of some views of world leaders. And my, my goal in this is a couple things. One, to stimulate you to pray for leaders more. Probably many of you do. But, but let's, let's pray for leaders, those in governmental places, high governmental places, with more intentionality and focus and specificity if we possibly can. So that's one of the goals. The other is for you to see some patterns of what the enemy is up to on a global scale. And the third is to see where the Holy Spirit is moving in a profound way globally. So this is more of a living room chat than it is any kind of a sermon. I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind tour through a bunch of slides very, very rapidly. 
And the thesis I'm going to start with is the same thing that's on the screen right now. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's the same scripture I started with a year ago. Now, all of you remember every word of my sermon from a year ago. So, I'm certain I don't have to repeat that. But blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And assuming that's true, which it is, then the flip side, cursed is the nation whose God is not the Lord. We have a ministry called Well-Versed. The ministry of Well-Versed is to bring biblical principles of governance to government leaders. I want to encourage you to pray for government leaders, unlikely persons. None of the government leaders I'm going to refer to are perfect. They're, they're, very, they're very flawed, every one of them. Their countries have problems, there's challenges. So I'm not lifting up any of these as kind of the model, but to encourage you to see how to pray for specific people. I'm going to start with an unusual one, in this case, to starting to pray for those in Muslim, they're in Muslim countries. Uh, this is in Egypt, Al Sisi in Egypt who's holding the Muslim Brotherhood down and rebuilding the Christian churches that, they're, that the Muslim Brotherhood burns down. Or Barzani in the Kurds. This is the group of people, the Kurds, who have a deep love for America. These are Muslims. Have a deep love for America and a deep love for Israel. They respect Israel because they battled, the Jewish people battled and got a country. They want their own country. They don't have a country. Now, I'm not implying these are perfect leaders again, but I want you to pray for people who are willing to adhere to biblical principles. When we were with them, they began to discuss such things as a theology of forgiveness. When have you ever heard that coming from those kind of environs? Or if we go to Jordan, in this case, uh, King Abdullah II. Uh, it was it within my lifetime, within Pastor Gary's lifetime, Israel and Jordan were at war. They were killing each other. And now we see a friendship that's rich. Pray for Benjamin Netanyahu who's been challenged in every way possible. I wish we don't have time to go through the riots that are taking place there over the judicial reform. But the judicial reform he's trying to bring about is badly needed. Because I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. It would be as if our Supreme Court was a self-perpetuating Supreme Court in effect because of the kind of influence the judges have on picking the successors. They have way too much influence in that process, and it's become very violational of, 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 of fundamental democracy principles. So pray for him in the midst of the tremendous challenges he's having in this country. Now, I gave you a report on this lady before, and my report's not changed. I wish it had. This is a lady who was swept into power by a prayer meeting, but the socialists came back in, in Bolivia, Janine Añez, and put her in prison. There were tremendous eruptions all over the country to get the, the, the dictators driven out. And because there were a number of deaths, maybe 16 deaths or something across the country in these uprisings that she had nothing to do with, because she came into power because when the dictator fled the country, the four people behind him fled the country. It kicked it to the sixth person in succession. She became the president overnight. She was a senator, became a president. And when they came back into power a year ago, threw her in prison, charged her with genocide, but she's not guilty of it all and almost died in prison. She doesn't look now like she does in this picture. Janine Añez, pray. We pray for some humanitarian organizations to come together to try to bring help to her. Her brother's an evangelical pastor in, in Bolivia. This one doesn't end well. Uh, President Hernandez in prison, charged with drug issues. I do not know whether they're true or not. And this goes to Bolsonaro. We met, met with him twice. My second time of meeting with him, the second time, and by the way, I, I don't get these people because I can just pick up the phone and call them. I don't have that kind of contact, kind of clout. I don't want to spin and sound like that. I just have friends who can get me there. That's how I get there. I don't get there on, on my own name. So I, I, I praise God for the connections he's provided me through other people. But we've been had the privilege of being with Bolsonaro. The second time we were with him there in Brazil, he, he sat there silent. And, and, and we began to pray over him and encourage him. And when he finally spoke, he just said these words. The cross is heavy. And what he's going through right now, falsely charged right now, out of power and falsely charged. That's a pattern globally we have run into over and over. When good people get thrown out, this kind of thing happens. Here's Jean Maté. This is in, in uh, uh, Guatemala. And he, he wasn't thrown out of power. It's an election taking place, a disputed election right now. But there's already plans by those coming in to try to charge him uh, with something. Uh, where have we ever seen this pattern before? I'll skip on by that. We recognize that pattern. I serve on President Trump's Faith Advisory Board. Now, I want you to remember the picture of these last few guys who've been charged, who are out of power and immediately charged with all kinds of things. When I get to Romania, I learn something. The Holy Spirit taught me through the Romanians about this, this particular issue. I'm going to jump you to Albania. 
This is mentioned in Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 19. Paul went to Albania. The gospel was established early there in Albania. I want you to see this young couple. They're pastors there. They came to me and I spoke to the pastors and I, we met with a bunch of political leaders there, former prime ministers, etc. <clears throat> and this wife in particular, the pastor, she said these words to me. She said, when communism fell in 1990, the missionaries came in and they did a good job and they reestablished things. They reestablished the church. The missionaries did a great job. But now we're the first generations of Albanian pastors. And what you have just said, we have never heard before because I told them to activate and be very involved in governmental issues. I prefer the word governmental over political. It's more biblical to be involved in governmental issues because the Bible speaks to those issues. That book, well versed, he referred to. We deal with minimum wage, health care, Social Security, health, uh, uh, welfare. You name the topic. God has already thought of that and he has a foundation for us to follow. Now that's from Albania. We met with, and here's a guy, Sali Berisha. He used to be the prime minister. He's now persona non grata in the country. Another former prime minister, his wife is part of the, uh, part of the uh, parliament there now. My message is pretty simple when I go to these countries, is that God loves your country, number one. Number two, God is smarter than we are. Number three, he loves us so much that he has a book for us, the Bible. And he lays out the way civil government is to work. God did not say after he wrote the book, wow, I forgot that old government thing. Number four, government, God invented government and he establishes nations. Five, to the extent that a nation will follow biblical principles of governance, to that extent, human pain, suffering, and poverty will be reduced. Conversely, to the extent that a nation violates the biblical principles of governance, to that extent, human pain, suffering, and poverty will increase. Every Christian understands that the Bible speaks to personal issues of life, to family issues, to church and congregational life, but very few seem to understand that the Bible speaks with specificity to the foundations for civil governance. When followed, a community, a nation can prosper and live in peace and tranquility. I encourage all to learn the biblical principles of governance. That's the heart of my message wherever we have the privilege of going. In Romania, here's a young member of their, what would be the equivalent of our House of Representatives. And here's a member of the Senate. And while I was there speaking, I had the privilege of speaking for some members of parliament. And the question came up, I said, tell me about the nature of corruption. And here's what I wanted you to hear, because I learned a lot there. They said, here's what happens. There are these individuals over here who are very corrupt. There are these individuals over here in government that are trying to do what's right. But once these guys get out of power, the corrupt ones will comb through every square inch of the lives of the people who are trying to do right, find something nitpicky and charge them so they can take them out and they charge them with corruption. We ran into that pattern country after country after country. It's a pattern that the enemy has established in much of the nation. I encourage you to pray for them. Latvia, I put it on a map because you may not remember exactly where that is. But here's a family. She was a member of the parliament. He is now a member of the parliament. His son is a member, their son is a member of the parliament. And, and the, the, the Latvian uh, national anthem is a prayer. And, and quite a few nations actually have that. But it's a prayer to God. And yet here's a, a country who just a few days ago or a few months ago uh, now has a head of state that's homosexual. It's this, one of seven countries that has a, seven, has a homosexual uh, head of state over the years. Here's from Liechtenstein, Prince Nicholas. Prince Nicholas, when I turned to him as we ended our conversation, how do you want me to pray for Liechtenstein? This very erudite man, a part of aristocracy, looked at me and said, pray that the people of Liechtenstein know Christ. Now I want you to remember that the tenderness, this is a man high level, who's lived his whole life in aristocracy. Pray that the people of my country know Christ. We take you to Hungary. The guy on the left there, we're in a prayer time, and the guy on the left is the head down. He came to me, said, oh, thank we, we've got to know the biblical principles of governance. Please help me, we've got to know. Now, the book is now in Hungarian. He said, please help me, I've got to know the biblical principles of governance. Victor Orban, controversial to some, not to me. He's giving godly leadership in spite of the accusations against that man. He is disdained across the European Union. He pays a high price for standing. If I had time, I would list to you the things that he does that scripturally in biblical right. Now, no, no, no leader is, is perfect. I, I, I could see that. 
all have their flaws and all their weaknesses. We understand that. But what he has brought in the country of Hungary is absolutely astounding and sort of saying, we are going to establish ourselves on the things of God. Now we're in the country of Finland. You see several of the people there are members of the parliament. They were exhausted that night after they'd been in long negotiations. But I want you to meet Pavi Ryson. Pavi Ryson in that lower picture on the left, member of parliament. For 28 years, a member of parliament, a medical doctor, the former minister of interior of Finland. Her husband is the president of a Bible college. She's charged with a crime. Her crime is, as she quoted from Romans chapter 1, verse 24 through 27, and social media, in a conversation with a bishop saying the church ought to stand on the right issue and not on the wrong issue on the homosexual question. And they've charged her with a crime. She was exonerated. So what they do, they immediately recharged her and she's back in the trials now. We were just with her a few days ago in Helsinki and she's going into trial in just a couple days from now. Pavi Retsinan, pray for her. Here is the former prime minister of Australia, uh, Tony Abbott. I, I wish you could have heard the speech he gave in London about a month ago. It, it was gripping. It was a world leader uh, in, a, in a venue with thinkers calling on the nations to rise and meet the challenge of the time. I've not heard a preacher who was ever better. Here is uh, from Slovenia, not as well known a country. And this is Jansa, uh, Jansen, uh, hard names to remember, admittedly. And, and he was the prime minister three different times of that country. What was interesting in that particular meeting that we were in with some world leaders in London, this was just recently, is they said, hopefully, hopefully. Now, these are people who were not talking uh, as, as regenerate people using the language you and I would tend to use, but they're people who have Judeo-Christian values at their very core, and they see what is happening. The phenomenon is globally. We'll, we'll have, I've been on, on Zoom calls with maybe a, a dozen countries represented from Latin America, with 60 people on the call. And as people go around the room, so to speak, on the Zoom call, they'll say, you won't believe what is happening in my country. The, the, the homosexual movement, the LBGTQ, the transgender movement is being forced upon, the climate change that forced upon us that's taking our private property rights. And you'll go to one country after another, they use the same language over and over. Satan is not particularly creative in the way he's operating right now in what he's doing. It's a global phenomenon. Most are not aware of the other country. This is a meeting we were at in Geneva a month ago, Geneva, Switzerland. Don't have time to go into who these people are. They're ambassadors, they're high level in government, and they represent things so well. My wife, Rosemary, loves collecting the maps of any place we go and taking them to the Knesset in Israel. We have a, a small ministry there where we study the Bible together with Jews and Christians studying the Bible together in the Knesset. Some members of the Knesset present, and some Jew, two Jewish rabbis in particular do the teaching of the Torah. It's, it's just very enlightening. But my wife in particular uh, loves to take the maps of the nations we've been to and bring them and present them in the Knesset. And they carry the deposit them before the heart of the Lord in that incredible city. I take you to Geneva, the United Nations, with all the challenges in the United Nations in New York City. We have a small ministry. It's not a large ministry at all. So I don't want to portray it that way. It's a very small ministry, but we have had the privilege of meeting with 93 of the 193 ambassadors at the United Nations, what are called permanent representatives. Pre-COVID, we were having these meetings. We had weekly meetings uh, going on in, in, in the United Nations and Bible studies at that time. This is the United Nations in Geneva, where we had a, a conference. And it was an exciting conference called GILP, Geneva Institute of Leadership and Public Policy. But a number of believers run this meeting trying to bring the Judeo-Christian value structure to the country. So when you think of the United Nations, I suspect you have some of the thoughts that I do about the United Nations and some of the things it does and the resolutions it passes that are so inappropriate, so off. But here's a godly man, fairly high up in the United Nations. There, pray for, I'm not gonna say the name, just pray for this brother. He's pretty high up in the institution. If you look at what is happening across Europe and what has happened, you might be inclined to give up, but it's not the first time Europe has been in a tough place. This is the Reformation wall. These are the figures on the Reformation wall. Farrell, Calvin, Beza, and Knox. There are people who stood. There are people who paid some enormously high prices to stand. They, re they refused to give up on the biblical order of governance. 
And as you well know, John Calvin is one of the most brilliant on that topic and what he accomplished in Geneva. In dark times before he got there, by the way. I took time recently, my wife and I stopped by Constance. Uh, Constance is on the German-Swiss border. Very important now. Nobody else stopped. Nobody knowing, cars driving by, people oblivious. This is the Hussenstein. It's where John Hus uh, was burned to the stake. Who was he? A buddy of his by the name of Jerome had gone from, from Prague over to England to study, study another one of the great reformers uh, under Tyndale. He, 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 he brought back, he brought back the truth of the gospel. It was so revolutionary that John Hus began to proclaim it. And they hauled him down to a court hearing on the German-Swiss border in Constance. Instead of being a hearing, as he thought he would have with ecclesiastical authorities, they threw him in prison under squalid conditions. They finally let him out of prison eight or nine months later. He was in horrible condition then. They let him through the streets, drug him by a rope, and people spit at him. They'd given cheap liquor to the whole town so they could kick at him. And they brought him here as he got one chance to recant. And he refused to recant. They lit a fire on the lower part of his body's legs. And a, and a, a man in a drunken stupor wandered forward and said, here, this will help you burn faster. And threw oil on his body. And the flames shot up. And he was heard to say, oh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. The flames went higher. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. A third time. Oh, Jesus, son of David. Those were his last words. Pogius Broccolate, the legal papal authority that was assigned to watch over him, hold him in prison, said to himself at that moment, 1415, July, said, truly, this man was too good for this world. Then they burned Jerome of Prague. This is the famous Hussenstein. Because he did what he did, Luther, less than 100 years later, 1517, was able to do what he did. Luther was accused of being a Hussite. And they were going to kill him for it. God miraculously protected him. But Luther was able to do what he did, understood what he did. And you have the gospel today because of the price that was paid by John Hus. England was a mess. It was horrible. And then came a man named John Wesley. John Wesley proclaimed the gospel. It transformed Lincoln. Uh, land of England was in squalid conditions. It was horrific. But he wouldn't give up and begin to proclaim the gospel. And it spread across England. It transformed England and went to nation after nation after nation. Across the street from Wesley's house where we're standing there in that picture about a month ago, is the top part of that is John Bunyan's grave, Pilgrim's Progress. On the lower right-hand side is the gravestone of Susanna Wesley, who gave birth to 19 children, 11 who died in infancy. But John and Charles Wesley changed the world. Standing on the, on the left is the tombstone of Isaac Watts, all just direct, direct across the street there. And he's the one who wrote, Joy to the world, or when I survey the wondrous cross, O God, the God our a hope of angels, angels pass. But in a dark, dark London, dark England, here came the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not give up on your country or any other country. I encourage you to stand for the truth of the gospel. Thank you for letting me give you this whirlwind tour. Here we go. Thank you, Jim. All right, so let's talk through some of these things. Um, folks, one of the reasons why I love what Jim presents when he travels, thank you, Dan, when, when he travels around talking about these things is that it helps us to recognize the privilege that we have in the United States of America and also at the same time to take warning that what has happened in other countries can come to America, and that it's, don't you think some of this is at our doorstep? Oh, it, it, it's not at our doorstep, it's in the house. It's in the house. Yeah, uh, we're, uh, we've moved beyond a moment of discipline. We've actually probably, it seems to me, entered into the season of judgment. We're on the early seasons of judgment. Not too late to repent, but we're already in the season of judgment. And you kind of alluded to it, but talk more specifically when you, when you talked about how when you've traveled and you've seen these world leaders, many of whom have served their countries well, and then they've been vilified, and then you, you, you've, they've actually been charged with different 
like they've been accused of different things. Like you, you mentioned, I, I wrote down her, her last name, Retsanan, in Finland. Yes. I mean, here's somebody who has served her country so well, and, and um, she, she quotes Romans 1. Verses 24 through 27 on social media to a bishop that she's writing, trying to get the, the church that once stood for biblical truth to once again stand for biblical truth. The civil government stepped in and charged her with a hate crime for doing that. Because of what, so it's like speech hate. Yeah, exactly. Hate speech. And specifically the issue of homosexuality. So she, she, she fared okay through the first trial. What does it look like for the second one? Don't have a way of knowing. We were just with her. I asked the same type of question. We, we don't know enough of the conditions on this one to know where it's going. But I think, uh, I, I believe we're within just a couple days of, of, her, of her new trial. So um, you've never shied away from being political. And I'm not asking you to take a position, but uh, as it relates to some of these charges against Trump right now, but do you see a similarity? I mean, with like, so the FBI shows up at mar largo does something unprecedented. Um, do, are you seeing when you travel the world and you're seeing these other leaders who, who end up being charged with various things, is there some similarity happening here? We're up against a cosmic struggle. This is a totalitarian authoritarianism on the move globally. Yeah. This is when you talk about World Economic Forum, yeah. or you talk about DEI or ESGs, uh, or, or the 15 minute city, if you've heard of that. So you, you can't, you have to be where you need to walk or ride a bicycle 15 minutes or long. It, it goes on and on the totalitarianism that has been on a mushroom the last three and a half years at a staggering pace. That's what we're dealing with. I wrote, a, I was asked by a nurse in Phoenix um, on Facebook in 2016. Pam Pryor is here, she'll remember this well. And I, she said, I don't want to vote for, for Hillary, but I really don't want to vote for Trump either. What do I do? So I responded on Facebook. And I, I listed 18 statements. I numbered them and put them back to her. Little did I know that that would go to 4.1 million shares. Hmm. And, and that's why the Trump team took a little notice. And that's why I ended up on the Trump advisory team. But one of them, I don't remember what number this was. I said, the key issue is going to be, and I didn't understand this at the time. The key issue is not going to be all these other things. The key issue is going to be one thing, his stand against globalism. Globalism is never seen as a good thing biblically. It's always tied with antichrist kind of spirit. Mm -hmm. And I said, I even commented, I said, I don't even understand fully what I'm writing here right now, but that's going to be the issue. I am stunned from 2016 writing that to the present time, how much I understand it much more clearly now, because certain organizations used to operate under the cover. They, they didn't want you to know under radar. Now their websites just carry all the information. Mm -hmm. They're blatant, they're open mm -hmm. on their freedoms. Whether it's our medical freedoms, our health freedoms, that's whether you, you look at political freedom, religious liberty, and economic liberties all stand and rise together. And I would add health freedom to that too. But if you take away one of those three, the others two go down. Or if one breaks through in a culture and rises up, political, economic, or religious. The other two tend to follow. Something happens. When I was in Romania, for example, all those countries fell in 1989 and 90, one after another. One, one would break through. What they do, they gathered in churches for the most part. And once they broke the law, gathered in churches, the religious liberty brought the economic and political right with it. Ceausescu was killed December the 25th, 1989. That's the only one of the European and Eastern countries where it was bloody. Most of the rest of them were bloodless revolutions, but one of them broke through and the other one came with it. Now we're in a reverse of that on a global scale right now. In Albania, they broke free in the recent elections, May 14th, 90% of those who won were socialist. Going back to the wrong direction, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Now, were those legitimate elections? I don't know, the questions we had circulating here for so long, and you're a domestic terrorist if you raise yeah, that question. Right, yeah, right, even for uh, you, you go down and look at what's happening in, in Bolivia. Well, mm -hmm. not Bolivia, rather Brazil's election. Mm -hmm. Was that legitimate? Well, there's, there's questions. And look at the parallel between Trump charged with January 6th and, and Bolsonaro in Brazil charged with an event he wasn't even around for. And they're charged the same kind of thing. So they isolate and find something they can go after mm -hmm. and then 
criminalize that person any way they vilify them yeah. in the media and you don't have the capacity to push back. That's why you need to be very careful and not believe much of what is reported uh, in, yeah. in media. And, and why is it that um, they can identify every single person who was there at January 6th, but they can't figure out the one person who brought cocaine into the White House? I can't, I can't understand that. Does that make sense to anybody? I'm sure there's no addicts in the White House. <laughs> they can't even understand. Who brought cocaine in there? Don't they have cameras? All right. <laughs> Let, um, I, except I wanna, that one room where it was. Except that one room, yeah. And then the other room where it was before. <laughs> And the third room before it was before that. Yeah, I know. I just showed up. Anyway, um, I digress. I want to ask you about Israel, but before I do, talk a little bit more on this subject. Define globalism and talk a little bit about World Economic Forum and how it's tied into that. Well, the government is obviously centralized. It's centralized globally. Uh, the further decision making gets away from you, the worse the decision making gets. So the ideal governmental decision making is the lowest possible place it could be, where it's closest. Uh, it's like uh, the senator from uh, Texas was told by a leftist one time, and he said, well, we, 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 we're part of the left and we love your children as much as you do. And the senator said, really, what's his name? No. Tell me my kid's name if you yeah. love him as much as I do. Yeah. Of course, obviously they did not know. So this is where the decisions are moved far away from the people. And it becomes an oligarchy. It's a small group. How much, how many, who are all in it? I don't fully understand it, comprehend it. Those who do understand it have told me there are roughly 300 families really kind of control this central. But you look at World Health Organization, mm -hmm. what's going on there? You're probably aware what took place, was it was six weeks ago in Geneva, the World Health Organization, where we're on a, we're on a time clock clicking right, clicking right now where over the course of this year, the sovereignty of the nations of the world, there's 193 nations, and I think there was 194th nation present for the meeting, uh, the sovereignty is signed over to who in case of a pandemic? Well, what's a pandemic? They define it. What's a pandemic? Climate change. What's a pandemic? Guns. Or the most bizarre one, a pandemic is an infodemic. What's an infodemic? A uh, release of too much information that might be misinformation or disinformation. Well, who defines what's the misinformation or disinformation? The answer is they do. So that is what we're seeing at a, at a global scale. Mm -hmm. And the capacity to resist is getting more and more challenging and way more costly. When you see a, a, a generally good leader go down in the country all of a sudden, or worse, be taken out, mm -hmm. Um, you need to ask some questions of what is actually happening here. I remember Michelle Bachman, really champ mutual friend, she, she, former congresswoman, she really championed this whole thing about us being aware of giving up our sovereignty to the World Health Organization. Do you know where did the United States end up coming down on that? There was not a single member of Congress present for that event, not one elected official. The Biden administration was represented there and John Kerry was the primary spokesman for the U.S. When he arrived on his eco-friendly jet, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. he arrived, he was introduced by his, I believe, 46-year-old daughter, a medical doctor, in which he proclaimed, my, my daughter taught me that the cause of all health challenges is the environment. Hmm. And, and so now the World Health Organization once designed to keep us healthy, to make us aware. Now it's about climate change. Mm. Most Americans are aware, of, unaware, for example, 1,300 mile pipelines trying to sequester CO2 gases, put them up to 3,000 pounds per square inch pressure, which is very, very high, put them in two foot pipelines and run through five, six states, 1,300 miles to the south to pump them a mile and a half in the earth, supposedly to save the planet. Mm. And at the same time, to show you the ineptness of government, there's another pipeline running parallel, going 1,300 miles north. I don't know the miles on that one, so let me withdraw that statement, but about the same distance north. The, the, the pipelines cross three different times. One's carrying it north, one's carrying it south, and, and what's gonna happen is a small group of people, George Soros type, or Bruce Rastetter, Rastetter out of Iowa, they're gonna make a gazillion dollars of taxpayer yeah. money for saving the planet. This type of thing is going, farmers are rising up in Iowa trying to stop this. 
from happening. If it would spring a leak, these are like a hydraulic hose on a tractor. I grew up on the farm, so I understand about that stuff. If it were to spring a leak in a valley, that, would, that is so heavy, that would wipe out a population in a matter of, of, a, few, of a few seconds. They don't want this on their farmland. They don't want this coming through their states, mm -hmm. but it's being coerced upon us right now. That's a part of this whole global phenomenon. And climate change, Don Hodel was Secretary of the Interior and Secretary of something else, I should remember, and I can't, energy. He was under Ronald Reagan. And he's the first one that taught me many years ago. He said, climate change has nothing, or global warming, as they called it back then, has nothing to do with clean water, clean air, clean land, because we all want that. Mm -hmm. Because God created this earth, we believe in creation care, we want to take care of this planet because we love the God who created the planet. So we have huge respect for the planet taking care of it. As believers, we're fiercely committed to creation care. But climate change, as it's called now, is all about changing the form we do government, moves into Marxism, and property rights are taken totally by virtue of this process. Mm. And when you're talking about, you know, countries who are surrendering their sovereignty to the World Health Organization, it fit, fits into Bible prophecy. Precisely. One world order, yep. and obviously, eventually, the rising of the Antichrist. You're the expert on this topic, mm -hmm. so I'm going to defer to you on this in the order of things. But we are certainly, yeah. up, it appears, getting very close to that. Now, I'm still trusting God for an outbreak of revival. Yeah. I believe the Asbury revival was a tiny peak in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my, wife and I, my wife and I had the privilege of attending the Asbury revival for nine hours. I'm a graduate of Asbury Theological Seminary. So you were actually there when they had their first revival. I actually arrived right after okay. that one. That was in February of 1970. And, uh, and, but I sort of felt the impact of it. Yeah. And, and, and then we went back this year and it was, it was like, Gary, it was, it was, it was like being in the Holy of Holies. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I just, just, I can, yeah, it's it difficult to up. talk about. Yeah, yeah. It was so sad. We sat there for nine hours and did not want to leave. In fact, we had to leave. Holly, who's over here, was there at the same time. I said, let me go back in just for another moment, yeah. just for another minute. Didn't want to leave the place. God has shown up in a profound place. So I'm trusting the Lord that things like yeah. the Jesus Revolution movie, which yeah, you're, you're yeah. tied to, and mm -hmm. Sound of Freedom movie, and these other yeah. indica or early indicators that God is stirring at a deep level. And yeah. I, I think when we were at this conference in London, had some pretty, pretty brainy people there politically. And, and, and the, there was a general consensus there. And they weren't like, a, this wasn't like a Christian meeting. These were just people who had the values that we hold and maybe don't even know fully why they do. Mm -hmm. But there was a sensing that they, I'm gonna use my language, the devil had overplayed his hand by virtue of the fact that the climate change mania, the religion of climate change, and the obsession with transgenderism and, and consumption with LBGTQ, et cetera, that it had reached a point where even secularists who still have some vestige of Judeo-Christian values are saying, right. this is too much. This is wacky. This, yeah. this may have peaked. We, got, we can't keep calling little boys girls and yeah. mutilating them. Mm -hmm. And so there's some sensing that we, we, we may have reached something that could help bring us back with enough moral consciousness in enough good people saying this is wrong. If God can touch the heart of a guy as vile as Bill Meyer on HBO, yeah. and he's saying this is nutty. Yeah, uh, it's more than that, it's sin. Yeah. But at least he realizes that. It gives me hope that that convicting power of the Holy Spirit is yeah. still whittling away. And all we need is a remnant, a well-placed critical mass, yeah. a remnant that can stand. And you and I have talked about the repents. We, we, we came here last uh, February and called members of Congress to a yeah. gathering mm -hmm. of repentance where they openly at the Museum of the Bible had an event. Two and a half hours of nonstop. Nobody was allowed to speak. Nobody was introduced. No applause was allowed. No breakfast was served, 6.30 in the morning. And Pam didn't like it, but no coffee was even served. And mm -hmm. 6.30 in the morning, we got there. You're we gonna pray, and only one kind of prayer, repentance. And you're mm -hmm. gonna pray repentance for personal sins, sin in the church, and national, America's national sins, and that alone. And God showed up. Yeah. Members of Congress, yeah. they wept openly and cried as they prayed. This year we're doing it January 31st, and we're inviting members of parliament from all over the world to come pray for America. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. By the way, you showed that picture of Farrell and Calvin and Beza and Knox. You know what they all have in common? What would that be? I'm waiting for this one. <laughs> Amazing beards. That's what I noticed. Okay. You guessed uh, the theological. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they were predestined to have those. <laughs> that's right. They're all, they're all Calvinists uh, by his name. Um, talk a little bit about what's, what's happening in Israel because I've also heard um, we have friends from Israel that, that were with us uh, a couple weeks ago. And... Uh, the wife is actually protesting against Netanyahu because of the, a lot of Israelis think that what Netanyahu is up to is a power grab, that he's more acting like a dictator. But you, you see it differently. Explain what, what's, what are we not understanding about this? Because it, so for those of you who aren't familiar, it's, so Netanyahu is trying to um, basically limit the power of the Israeli Supreme Court. And, and how he's going about that comes across as you're just power grabbing as prime minister and you're kind of turning into a dictator. But you see it differently and explain why. Yeah. Let's just come to our country in the three branches of government. Why do we have three branches of government? Because it's better than four or five or 10 or better than two or better than one? Well, the answer is because of original sin. We recognize right. that check and balance is necessary. It's a theological reason we have one branch. And it wasn't intended to be equal branches of government originally. It was intended that the legislative branch would have the most authority because there's so many more people in that one, obviously now 535. Let's go over to that country. You have a similar kind of situation, only it gets really messier in the sense that the Supreme Court in effect becomes a self-perpetuating board. It's not like they directly choose their, their those who follow them, but what happens is their board of, let's see, it's seven, I believe, no, nine, excuse me, nine. And uh, it's made up of various groups, uh, nine people. But three of them are from the Supreme Court. But nobody can pass without a vote of seven. You have to have seven of the nine to come on the Supreme Court. Well, the Supreme Court itself has three of those votes, enough to block anybody, as you can see. Hmm. So that's way too much power uh, to a group of people who are unelected. And what he's trying to do is bring it back within the framework of how any healthy democracy, I won't say constitutional republic like us, because they don't have a constitution. They, they came in existence in a day. They were attacked by five countries the next day. They never got a chance to put a constitution together. They had a lot of difficulty even agreeing on one. So they have some kind of overarching principles, but they have no functioning constitution. So it's a democracy that's trying to function. And Netanyahu is 100% right in trying to bring it with an appropriate balance. Because these unelected figures, who in a sense I would call self-perpetuating by virtue of the clout they have on the mm -hmm. selection process, literally have full authority to shut down anything. It's like our own Supreme Court that has gotten very aggressive and legislated from the bench. And we see that, of course, so, so often occurring. So I would contend he's doing a remarkable job. My wife, my wife over here has been to Israel 75 times. She's the expert on Israel way more than I'll ever be, Rosemary. But we, we are really applauding uh, Netanyahu for doing this. He's not a perfect leader. I think he handled COVID very poorly, but virtually everything else he's handled. And, and then look how they went after him. Well, okay, there's a bottle of champagne here, a piece of furniture here. They've, they tried to find something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if someone wants to go after any person in this audience and you want to turn, unleash governmental things on any one of you, they'll find some law, sure. somehow, somewhere you violated. Mm -hmm. You just can't, you don't even know all the laws mm -hmm. for that matter. And so that's what Netanyahu has faced a great in his country. It's miraculous he's survived back for the third time. What do you think it will take for us to see the kind of revival that by applause here, we all really want in America again. What's it gonna take, Jim? I think it's gonna to have, to, have to really start with repentance in the church. Yeah. Um, you and I have talked a lot about this. I, let me just say, I hope Cornerstone Chapel, you know I was gonna say this, I hope you realize the quality of leader you have as your senior pastor. Mm. You are, this is remarkable. <laughs> this, this is, this is. 
there, I think I may have thrown these stats at you when I was here before, I'm not sure if I did, but there are roughly 346,000 places of worship in the U.S. I'm gonna quote Barna here. I'm gonna take out 20,000 that are Hindu, Buddhist, Sikhs, everything else, Muslim, uh, Jewish, everything not Christian. Then I'm gonna take out 20,000 approximate Roman Catholic churches because I haven't studied Roman Catholic churches enough to know about that. So that leaves us with the evangelical church. So we're down to 324,000, I say uh, Protestant churches, I should say. Now, how many of those are liberal who are by definition are not Bible be believing Bible teaching? The answer is 72%. So now it takes another big hit. So it leaves 28% that are actually Bible teaching. That's 100,000, that sounds good. Until you ask the question, how many of those have a bona fide biblical worldview? You can point out to a key set of, uh, uh, of issues that are present in that church where there's application of the scripture to every component of life. Now you get down to a much smaller number. I don't know the number, but I, I would be really pleased if it was 15,000. I'd be ecstatic if it was 30,000. I don't think it's near that high. And he, here you are in the, I'm going to say that you're in the shadows of the Capitol building. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you couldn't be more visible. And you're a church that has grown a lot. That puts you in the crosshairs of the enemy and the enemy's best friends. And for you to take the stands you do and stand by your pastor, you have no idea what it costs this man to take the stand he does. Find every way you can. He didn't know I was going to say any of this. Yeah. To support him, to encourage him, to love on his family, his wife. Find every way you can to speak well of him. And because I, I assure you, the enemy would love to take this congregation out and they would get it by going after him in some way. Yeah. And there are, there are the good news is there are a number of bold, courageous pastors around the country. The bad news is there are way too few of them but you are strategically placed. I don't know any of you, I don't know the names of any of you, except the few I referred to over here, I don't know, two or three of you. But I suspect a number of you, if I were to know the truth, came here from another church because you found a shepherd who would not stand in the culture in which you find yourself. And that, I'm gonna sound very, very straightforward. That is as it should be. If a pastor will not stand, the people should leave that place and not support that and stand with the pastors that are standing because our only chance is having an authentic church, a scriptural proclaiming church, a church that's so contrite and broken of heart, they're willing to repent of personal sins, of the sin in the church and come before God asking, more time and forgiveness and healing for our national sins as well. You are in one of those congregations, but you are in the congregation that is most strategically placed of almost any congregation in America. Thank you for all of you. Mm. And sir, I admire you and respect you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for saying all that. Thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna end uh, promoting you now because of all of that. Um, his book, Well Versed, is available in the atrium, uh, $14 each, $7 if you get two or more. So you might as well get two if you're going to pay the 14 bucks, right? And, uh, but two or more, $150 for a case. And um, this helps to support your ministry. Plus, you're throwing in this whole calendar here uh, with all these Jewish holidays uh, throughout. So that's, anybody who buys a book, they get a calendar. They're biblical holidays and, and yeah. we can keep them too if we want. The book, by the way, well versed, I'm selling it at my cost with no profit. Why? As my income doesn't come from that. This, if you buy one, I'm gonna make it harder on you, make you pay the $14. <laughs> well, who would wanna do that if you can get two for $14? <laughs> so I'm, I'm asking you to buy as many as you can, take it by the case, there's 24 in a case. The issue is not profit, because there is no profit for me in this. The issue is, can we save the republic? Yeah. Is America worth saving? Yes. Can we save the republic? I pray so. What's the answer? Biblical truth. So you can, you can take your camera out, you can take your phone out, take a picture of that right now, and you can order online, or at the table. We have a bunch of books out there for you. We shipped mm -hmm. out here. And I want to encourage you to take them to your friends, your neighbors, maybe get them for some of your children that are maybe not following the pathway like they ought to. 
And then let me make you aware of a book that's going to come out at the end of oh, the yeah, year. Oh, yeah, you just wrote a new one. What's well, I'm called? in the process of writing it, only okay. halfway done right now. Go to the next screen, if you would. This shows a book called Well-Versed in a Woke World. The cover won't look like this, but this is a mock-up temporary cover. Uh -huh. And this one, and this one we, we cover 60. The first one covers 30 topics. Then we cover an additional 60. So the biblical foundation for AI, a transhumanism, <laughs> some bizarre, bizarre oh, wow. stuff. It's just, it's so, it's so severe where our nation, our nations are going. Uh, genetic mutation, cloning, uh, reparations, uh, ESG, DEI, BLM, uh, CRT, all of these kind of topics that are today, the hot button topics you see on news every night, 60 of them, I lay out the biblical foundations for every one of those. And their short chapters are intentionally very short. Only a few pages, each one, to, to try to get you up to speed very fast on the scriptural foundations, how we address every one of those. So if you'd like information on that one, again, come by the booth and give us your, your contact information or, or just shoot a picture of that and you can go online and uh, we'll keep you informed when that book comes out. At the end. We're, we're trying to get out at the same time a youth version, a children's version, and if we can, with God's help, a children's coloring book will come out so because the, the the left the enemy is going after people this young yeah. so so are we yeah we're going after the kids yeah what's your real quickly what is your website for wellversed wellversedworld.org wellversed world that's with a d on the end wellversedworld.org and then if you want to join us on sunday nights don't join us on wednesday nights you need to be here on wednesday nights but on sunday and wednesday nights at, at 8 p.m eastern we interview newsmakers from around the world. All these people you saw on the screen, we try to interview them, members of Congress, uh, the Netherlands, what's going on there with the farmers, the Canadian, Canadian truckers, interviewing all these people for the first about 45 minutes and we go into people praying into the news. Whatever news we've just heard, people prayer. It's on the world, bring the next screen up on the World Prayer Network, there it is, worldprayernetwork.org. It's every Wednesday and Sunday night, 8 p.m. And uh, if, if you don't have something on Sunday night, maybe you do. Do you have something? No, we don't have Sunday night, but okay. who's doing your, your thing tonight? Yes, I am. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you pre-record it? I, I'm cloned. I believe in cloning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did pre-record it tonight so I could be with you, my brother. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, Jim, thank you for, you know, men like you make it easy for guys like me to be bold and courageous because you've, you have taken your sickle out ahead of us and you've plowed the path for guys like me. So thank you for being so courageous and doing what you've been doing for more than 40 years now in ministry. Yeah, yeah. yeah praise God. It's, it's more like 50, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> can, my, can, can, can I have my wife come and pray for you? I would love that. Yes, Rosemary, please. I want you to come up here. Yes, thank Let's you. Let's pray, pray for this brother. And thank you. His wife, well, the rapture occurred and she made it and we missed it. Yeah, I, I don't okay. know what happened to her. She, Went, went, she went to, to get, go the get book? your book oh, for okay. real? I <laughs> have a free copy. Doesn't she know that? <laughs> I know the guy who wrote this. <laughs> I'm not where she is, but we can pray for her. Yeah. Even if she's back there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me get this microphone over to you so you can. All right. Yes. Thank you. We come before you, our almighty, heavenly Father. Yes. Great and mighty God, we're so grateful you have desired and called us into existence and you have brought forth the man of God, Gary Hamrick, for such mm -hmm. a time mm -hmm. as this. Father, he is your treasure. He is your beloved son and you have anointed him both to rule and reign with you, not just in eternity, but now here on earth. So Father, we ask and pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would descend upon him with the governmental anointing upon his shoulders, with wisdom and power and might and strength and counsel and fear of the Lord. Father, even as his voice is lifted up and he expresses words, they will come from your throne and they will shake both heaven and earth. We thank you, Father, that um, he is a man of God preparing for your coming. And even as John the Baptist, Lord, he will take down the high places of darkness, Father, and he will lift up the deep valleys and 
prepare that highway of holiness for your people. We thank you, Father, also for the anointing for Israel, for divine favor with the people of, of the covenant that through his life and ministry, they will see Yeshua. Father, they will, their eyes will be opened and they will know who the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has come to them already and is returning to them soon. So thank you as you prepare his footsteps in that holy land that he will be one of the architects of your um, coming kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I just thank you for Jim and Rosemary. Pray that you would continue to open doors for them, that you would use them in a mighty way. And I thank you for just Jim's um, faithfulness to you over these 50 plus years of serving you, who has plowed the way and made it easier for guys like me to come along. And I just thank you for him and for Rosemary. Bless them and continue to use them for your glory among world leaders, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Rosemary. God bless you all. Have a great night.